how hard did you push it till I black out? Yes. Numerous times, yes. Happening, municipals. This is your boy Big C. We have a awesome guest this week, um, Sean Ogle of Breaking80.com, Breaking80 on Instagram. If you don't know, you should absolutely give him a follow. Check out his website; it is awesome. Course reviews, product reviews. There's there's a lot going on on his channels, so please check those out. But no further review. Sean, how's it going, buddy? Good. It's going great. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so we're just going to kind of jump into it. I mean, how did you get started in the game? Where did you grow up? Who got you into golf? Yeah, so I'm, I'm close to you. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, um, and I grew up playing competitive tennis. That was like my entire childhood, you know, high school, you know, won districts, third place at state, was like a good tennis player. And I realized as I like, you know, started getting close to graduating high school, I was burnt out of tennis. I was just kind of sick of it. And my uncle gave me a set of clubs. He gave me a set of clubs from, you know, a place you'll probably have heard of, Fiddler's Green, which is, uh, you know, a tiny par three course that has a huge pro shop outside Eugene. And so he gave me some of their like homemade clubs. And when I went to Oregon State University, especially as I got into my junior, senior year, I had some, you know, flexible schedules and I started playing, you know, three, four times a week and just kind of got the bug like you do. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, you went to Oregon State and Tristan Tree is my home course. And the course that I play now um, is not the same course that you played in college as Dan Hickson, uh, one of my favorite local designers, if not one of the best designers out there in the game right now went and redesigned the course. So the actual team had a better practice facility for themselves. That is more upper echelon that can compete with some of the bigger programs across the country. Um, And we were just chatting. We need to get back out there because you haven't gotten to play the new Dan Hickson track yet. I haven't. It's been years since I've been, been back to play. But it was great because when I was in college, it was nine bucks for nine holes or 17 bucks for 18 if you were a student. So I'd go out before class, you know, get some rounds in. And yeah, you know, the everything I've heard about the work that they've done is supposed to be great. So I'm excited to get back out there and hopefully we can go uh, go tee it up sometime this spring or summer. Absolutely. Anytime you want to, Tristan Tree is is one of my favorites. And I got the pleasure to bring Ashton out, uh, my co-host, who fortunately... Uh, Got tied up with work, couldn't meet us today, but got him out there when he came and visited last spring, and he was blown away at how how good the track was as well. So I'm excited to get you out there. Definitely. Um, So tell us a little bit about the origins of Breaking 80. When did you decide you wanted to start this? Um, Where and how did it start? And how did you get to the point that you're at now? Yeah, so you can't really tell the Breaking 80 story without telling the location rebel story. So I graduated from college July of 2007, finance degree, you know, went to go work for a portfolio analyst as a small, uh, at a small investment firm. So, you know, for those of you that remember July of 07, you know, kind of worst time ever, peak of the market, worst time ever to get into finance. So by February of 09, the market had collapsed. My boss was unhappy. Our clients were unhappy. I was unhappy. You know, my, my foray into suit and tie and having a real job was just not what I expected it would be. And so I saved up all my vacation time for the year in 2009 and went down to Rio for Carnival with my best friend. And so we went like hang gliding over the city. We danced in the carnival parade. We went down to Iguazu Falls, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Um, Just had this like unbelievable experience. And on the last day, we were like, we should be able to do this whenever we want. And I was getting ready to go back to work. I had no vacation time left. It was going to be rough. Um, To make matters worse, the day I got back, I got a 20% pay cut because of, you know, the financial markets and everything that happened. So a couple months later, I started a blog as I was going through my like quarter life crisis, which is now known as Location Rebel, um, and just kind of started talking about all the things I wanted to do in life. I published my bucket list, um, you know, as a way to hold myself accountable for wanting to do these things. 
And it's a, a bit of a longer story, but the long story or the short version is October of 2009, I left. January of 2010, I moved to Thailand for a year and I continued to grow this blog and this website where now I'm still doing it 12 years, 13, 14 years later, uh, teaching people how to build small online businesses. So fast forward a couple years, Location Rebels had some success. I'm still working for myself. I'm traveling, you know, quite a bit, uh, and I'm getting more and more into golf. I'm getting excited. You know, I've got some free time, so I'm playing during the week up in Portland, playing some of the, you know, local muni courses like uh, Heron Lakes, Eastmoreland, Redtail. For anyone that's familiar with the Portland area, and in August of 2012 was basically like, look, I've learned a lot about blogging. I've learned a lot about internet marketing. Let's apply this to something that I'm excited about. And so I started Breaking 80. And just kind of on a whim started, you know, writing about golf stuff and had no real clue what I was doing in the golf world, but just knew that at the time, there weren't many golf blogs out there. This was before, you know, no laying up. This was before like, you know, Eric, like this was before like any of the like, quote unquote, like golf influencers were around. There were very few really interesting cool things going on in golf. And so I was like, all right, I want to create the, the golf blog that I want to read. And within a year, that kind of morphed into me wanting to play the top 100 public courses. So I started traveling around. I took photos. I'd write about them. And by the time I got to like 30 out of 100 and I'm traveling like all over the place, uh, I kind of realized it's like, well, if I'm doing all this traveling, then I'd also like to play the top 100 courses, not just the, the public ones. And then that morphed into taking a Scotland trip. And at one point, I had played more of the top 100 in the world than the top 100 in America. So I was like, cool, we'll just kind of go after all these lists and mostly just try and play as many cool, interesting golf courses around the world as I can uh, while doing it with as many cool, interesting golfers and people throughout the process. And so that's how Breaking 80 started. And it's just kind of evolved from there over the course of the last decade. So with the the top 100 courses, I've looked at the website a little bit, and it looks like you kind of go off of multiple uh, different rankings through either golf.com, Golf Digest. What Did you create like kind of your own mix of, of all of those to kind of create your own top 100, or are you just going based off of those those rankings? Yeah, so what happened, you know, three, four, or five years into this, first off, um, when I first kind of started going after the top 100, there weren't really many other people that were doing it. Um, there was John Sabino who had a blog about it that was great. Uh, there was a, a guy named Steve who had a site called golftripper.com that was doing the top in the US, but no one was really talking about this. So I was like, cool, this is kind of a cool, unique hook for Breaking 80. And as the years went on and I was playing these, more and more people started to do it. Uh, it became not only less cool, but a lot of people were like angry. Oh, you're just trying to tick boxes. Like you don't care about the courses and all that kind of stuff. And so I started downplaying, you know, that quest on the site. Um, and it really was less about completing any one specific list, but looking at, you know, golf digest list, golf magazine list, top 100 golf courses, um, golf week, and just kind of looking at all of those and saying, okay, what are the, the best golf courses around the world um, that you know some of these people are talking about? And so I still would try and go, and I do still try and go and play as many of those as I can and write about them and tell interesting stories about them on Breaking 80. Um, but you learn pretty quickly when you're doing something like this that as cool it is, as it is to go play these great golf courses, it's really all about the people. It's about the people. It's about the experiences. And so it became much less about, hey, how can I get on this place, but more about, hey, I want to go play golf with you. How can we make that happen? And so that's how everything is kind of, you know, morphed a little bit. So I'm not going to say I'm still not trying to complete it. You know, I think that on the current 2019 golf magazine list, I think I'm at like 54 out of 100 or something like that. So, you know, once I've made significant progress on one of the lists versus some of the others that I might, you know, start being a little bit more diligent about it. But at this point, I still have so many places I'd like to see. So we're just... uh 
kind of going going from there. <laughs> it's a it's a hard thing to accomplish because it's not only the time that you have to put into getting to these places, the travel that you put into it, but the the financial side of things to to complete yep. <laughs> these, especially the top 100 courses. I mean, most of those are either going to be hard to access or they're just going to be extremely expensive to be able to access. Totally. So, you know, I, I give you massive props for even getting through half of, of the top 100 because it's it's not an easy feat. I mean, I myself went on a journey to where I tried. I'm still trying to play every public course on the West Coast. All of our listeners kind of know my backstory there. And it's there's eleven hundred and ninety three public courses that I mapped out. Oh, my and, goodness. You know, I've played just over half of them. So oh, that is an accomplishment. That is crazy. Yeah, it's it's been a journey and a lot of them I ticked off the box through COVID. You know, luckily the government was paying me to play golf. So it was yep. a really nice time to be able to get out every day. You know, my wife was like, yeah, get out of the house. We're stuck together. The only thing we could do was play golf. So I literally would drive two to four hours to play 18 holes and then drive back you know, oh, one day. My. And so every day, five to six days a week, I was playing a new course somewhere in, in California or Oregon, uh, for the most part. And then we ended up moving, we were living in the Bay area at that time. And then we ended up moving back to Portland because my wife got her job. And that's when I got to start, you know, reaching out to a lot of the courses in Washington and some of the more untouchable places in, in Oregon. And that's when I was able to go up and play, you know, courses like Peninsula Golf Club, which is at the furthest tip of the Puget Sound. And you can actually see Victoria, Canada from the golf course. Oh, and super cool. Really cool. Getting getting out and playing, you know, Battleground, which is a course, you know, up past Seattle, Snohomish, which is a beautiful course up there. You know, courses yeah. that were much more untouchable for me, but because I had the time, you know, I was taking these mini road trips by myself and, and knocking them out one, one at a time. And it's probably one of the coolest experiences to go on a journey like that. To, to experience all these things because it's not just about the golf like you were talking about. It's a lot to do with the people and and the the conversations that you have and the relationships that you create. I mean Snohomish, I became really close with the the owners and his wife um out there and they're wonderful people and you know the general manager out at Peninsula Golf Club invited me out and they were absolutely wonderful and and just the conversations and Andre and Paulo down in Coos all of those guys I've become really good friends with and there's been connections and friendships that formed outside of golf and just seeing new courses and I think that's the coolest part about golf is it's the community that we all are within and it's a lot smaller than we all think Oh, if there's one thing I've learned through like doing Breaking 80 and my own travels is that the golf community is is very small. It's very tight knit. And going back to your you know point about the cost, you know, so much of it is because of starting the blog, and so much of me being able to do it financially is because of all the people I've met and the relationships I've built, and you know, doing things like you know, spending the time to take photos and write about a golf course and highlight it in a positive way and tell their story. It makes it that much easier for another course to be like, Hey, you know, come on out. We'd like you to do the, the same thing for us. And that's been a big reason I've been able to do that. Um, so there's a lot you can talk about there, but also I really want to talk a little bit about just this idea of the quest. You know, the, the quest is like, it is something that has been a big part of my life. And I think that it can add value to a lot of people's lives, depending on how you look at it. But, you know, it started with my bucket list and I posted a hundred things that I wanted to do in life. And for the first two or three years of blogging, that was the thing that kind of kept me going. It was like, here's these lists of things. Like if I don't do them now, when am I going to do it? So it might've been like climb a mountain, go to Cuba, live on a tropical Island, uh, play Pebble beach. Like those were all things that, you know, I, I did after starting it. Um, but I found in terms of having this kind of golf quest, you know, top 100 or whatever, uh, it takes you to places you never would have gone elsewhere. So 
you know, for me, the first golf trip I ever took was a solo trip. I flew into Milwaukee, went and played all the Kohler courses, uh, played Aaron Hills, drove back through Chicago, and then went all the way up through um, Michigan and played like Arcadia Bluffs and Bay Harbor and Boyne and Forest Dunes and all of these courses. And I would have never gone to northern Michigan uh, by myself if it weren't for golf. And all of the people that I met along the way and people that I still consider friends, um, it opens you up to a whole different way of traveling and a whole different way of meeting people. And so what I've found is I've also got this much more, maybe not more, but very stupid quest to go to the top 100 bars in the world. (laughs) So... I've been to 59 of them. Um, And what I found is if you go to a place like Paris, for instance, it's like, yeah, everybody knows you go to the Louvre, you go to the Eiffel Tower, you go to all the hotspots, you go to Versailles. But when you go find these bars, there was like four or five top 100 bars in Paris. They're in different neighborhoods I might not have gone to elsewhere. So you go to these neighborhoods where you get to see more of a local experience. You sit at the bar and you talk to the people that are there. You talk to the bartenders. And that opens up a whole new world of things to see in a city that most tourists don't get to see. So you're building relationships. It gives you a reason to you know go out and experience different places and travel around. You meet some of the most amazing people ever. And, you know, not most important, but one of the coolest parts about all of that is that it then gives you all sorts of cool stories to tell along the way. So I can't imagine how many interesting stories you have based on, you know, your goal of playing the, you know, top public course or all the public courses on the West Coast. Um, And the stories that came from that that never would have happened if you hadn't created that goal. So I'm just this like huge proponent of, I think everybody, whatever your thing is, whether you like coffee shops, whether you like, you know, you know, bookstores, whatever it is, find the thing you like to do and kind of create a quest around it. And, you know, my friend Patrick Koenig, who's a golf Instagrammer is now trying to set the world record for most unique golf courses played in 365 days. And so he's in an RV and he's traveling all over the country and that's like his quest. And so I think that, I don't know. I just, I could go on and on about I, the value of having a quest in your life. Um, so take that for what it's worth. There's my rant for the day. <laughs> no, it's, it's, so for me, it all started out, I've always been a guy that collects things or, you know, I've always had that, that quest that you're talking about where if it was, you know, I collected records uh, and I still do. So anywhere on my travels, I, I stop in record shops and I collect Love records it. and, you know, it started with sneakers when I was in high school and, you know, I've got enough pairs of sneakers to wear a different pair every day of the, every day <laughs> of the year. So it, it's, I've always been a person that collects and, and utilizes that quest to find, you know, certain things that I've been looking for. And I have lists of, for golf courses, records, shoes, like it's just, it's all encompassing for me. Yes. My whole life is a quest for something. And I I think that gives me fulfillment within my life. And that's the biggest thing I love about golf is every time that I'm able to experience something new, it gives me that amazing fulfillment. And when you get to experience that with some of your best friends or, you know, new people that you meet, I mean, one of our favorite stories to tell is the origin story of the municipals. And it was during COVID. Um, you know, we've told this story on the pod, but I'll give you kind of a brief snap, uh, brief uh, description of it. So basically, uh, we were in this big group chat in the Bay Area, and I posted in there, hey, I want to do a Southern California golf trip. I want to hop in a in a van, play six courses in four days. And and if anybody's into this, you know, DM me, let me know. Yeah. And you just have to take a COVID test and make sure we're all good because we're going to be in the same cars, hotels <laughs> totally. for this trip. And so three guys hit us up or hit me up and said they were in. And it was perfect. I was like, perfect foursome. We're good to go. I planned the whole trip, showed up in San Francisco, never met these guys in person ever before this trip. Yep. Um, picked these guys up. We became best friends out of this trip. And Ashton is now uh, the co-host of my podcast. And he was one of the Love guys it. that went on the trip. Uh, so, so cool. 
people. Yeah, and that I would have never happened without golf or with that quest that we're talking about. And I just think it's so important, especially us getting older. We talk about making friends at an older age is much more difficult. And I think yeah. golf eases that pain a little bit for most of us when we get into our 30s and 40s it's not as easy to go out and meet new people and golf is that common ground that allows us to you know meet new people and create new friends that end up being you know kind of a lifelong thing totally i could not agree more and it's been amazing to see over the last you know five years as breaking 80 has grown how many new people I've met and how many people are now close friends because of it. And the, you know, the stories and the experiences and everything that goes along with it. You know, one of the things that I started doing with breaking 80 is, you know, I was getting all these people that were members of these top clubs that were inviting me out to their courses. And I was like, well, there's, there's gotta be a way to connect all of these people that are like members of cool clubs. And they like to show it off to people that will appreciate it. They like to travel and see new places and they like to geek out about golf on the internet. And so I don't know if you've come across on my site, but I started this golf society called the 80 club. And so it's basically, uh, there's like 270 of us now and it, everyone's a member of a club and they like to travel and they like to play golf with different people. And through this community, there's now been hundreds of crazy connections that people have had. You know, one person was going to, you know, early on in the club, one person was going on an Ireland trip and the buddy he was going with backed out and he had a bunch of, um, you know, rounds and hotels that he couldn't cancel. So he posted on our forum. He's like, Hey, this is like, short notice and kind of weird, but I'm going to Ireland in two weeks and my buddy bailed. Does anyone want to go? And one guy's like, sure, I'll go. So sight unseen, they took a trip to Ireland together, had a great time. And it's just like all of those types of experiences that have come from it and come from golf is, it's just so cool. And so, you know, I feel like we've gone on about this for 10 or 15 minutes, but it really is true. Um, and I think that's the, the magic of golf that I don't think most people realize when they start getting into golf and they start taking it seriously, that that is the best part about it. It's not the game itself, but it's all those stories, relationships, connections that come from it. And that's what makes it such a, a special community and such a special game. Yeah. And one thing that we're doing this year, it's a new video series that we're going to, we're going to start doing. Uh, we're teaming up with union green. They're going to pay for us to do this, this video series. And Thank you, Union Green, for, for joining on with us this year. But um, we're going to utilize this this um, traveling site called Pack Up and Go. And I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they basically book you surprise trips. So you don't know where you're going until you are on the way to the airport. Oh, they that's give you cool. an email. Yeah, so they give you an email that tells you what the weather's going to be and the style of clothes that you should pack for the place that you're going. Oh, then I love you get that. A packet. Yeah, and you get a packet in the mail that you're not supposed to open till either the night before or on the way to the airport. They tell you ahead of time what airport you need to go to, what time you need to be, your flight is, so that you at least know where you're going. And so we're going to utilize Pack Up and Go, and we're going to basically fly to a random location, have to find a rental car, and you know, uh, they basically only book you flights and hotels. Then they give you kind of itinerary of like good bars and restaurants and things yeah. to go to. They, they don't necessarily do this for golf. We're just going to utilize them for this. Totally. And so our job is to get a car booked and then also to scramble around while we're sitting in the airport and find tea times at golf oh, courses in the so location cool. that we're going. I love so it. We won't know what courses we're going to play. We won't know anything about it. And it's going to be just a really exciting time to be able to fly into, you know, a random location and just experience their local golf scene. And totally. I think it's going to be a great way for in a cheap way for people to be able to do, you know, a golf trip with their buddies without, you know, breaking the bank or having to like go out of their way to plan a bunch of stuff. You just fly there and wing it, see what happens. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a really good experience. I think, I think it's going to be something that everybody's going to enjoy watching and it's going to be really, really fun there. Um, 
So, Sean, out of the 36 top 100 courses that you've played, what tracks have stood out to you, or is there a track that you might have picked out that might just shine as a beacon of light for public golf that you played within those 36? Oh, there's... (laughs) There's so many. And part of it is like you've got levels of public golf, right? So my number one favorite course of all time is a public course, but it's Pebble Beach. It's public. So it's like it's public, <laughs> but it might as well be private for how much it costs to, to go and do it. And so I've, a lot of people, times people ask me, it's like, you know, is it is it worth it? And it's like if you're a golfer, to do it once – Yes, it's 100% worth it. Whether you love it or hate it, whether you will do it again, you know, it's it's just one of those experiences I feel like every golfer should have. But I've played it three times now, and every time, more than any course I've played, even for me personally, more than the old course at St. Andrews, like, the weight of playing it, it just had this, like, presence of being there where you're, the whole time you're just like, oh, my God, I'm playing Pebble Beach. This is amazing. And you get into that stretch of, like, four through ten, and it just keeps getting better. And so so that's the big one for me that stands out. <laughs> yeah, so I actually got to play Pebble Beach during COVID because they were doing the deal. We were living in the Bay Area at the time, and they were doing a deal where you didn't have to play and stay. It was three hundred and twenty-five dollars oh, cool. to play. Oh, that's insane. Yeah, got to do that. <laughs> yeah, so I went out there and I knocked out the whole Pebble Beach Resort in one in like two weeks. So I played Spyglass, Spanish, Del Monte, um, and and Pebble all in like a two week oh. span, and it was under a thousand dollars for all of it. That is so. I've got some other, you know, public courses that stand out I'm going to talk about, but I want to know what's your take on on Pebble? Is it does it live up to the hype for you? So for me, I think it's one of those places that you have to see. It's it there there's just a feeling of of just aura around you when you step out for the first time to Pebble because of all the people that have been on that course, not only professional golfers, but like when I was a kid, I used to go out and see Bill Murray driving an ice cream uh, yeah, truck totally. onto the <laughs> golf course during a pro-am. And like, you know, I met Peyton Manning, um, who I'm a giant, I'm a huge Indianapolis Colts fan. Yeah. And so I got to meet Peyton out there and he signed, you know, an autograph for me and just outside of the professional golf, the U S opens, the PGA championships, all these different, um, accolades that they have on their rankings. It's just the amount of, you know, celebrities in just an aura that you feel when you step out there for the first time, it's, it's worth every penny. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's one of those things where, if it takes you 10 years to plan it and save up and, you know, start a five gallon coin jar to, to just <laughs> totally. like save, you know, money, just get out there. It doesn't matter when you can get out there, but get out there one time. Every golfer should experience Pebble. I've been roasted because I actually have a take that Poppy is a better track than Pebble. Okay. I've heard people say that about all of the courses. You might be the first one I've heard say that about Poppy, but I've heard people like to their deathbed or like Spanish Bay is a more fun course or Spyglass. So I can't fault anyone for those opinions, but I want to hear why. Spy, Spy, I could see that. I think Spanish has its own feel. I don't quirkiness. compare it, but <laughs> it quirkiness. Yeah, I don't think it's it's there but i think after the redesign poppy hills became the crown jewel of architecture when it comes to golf or i'm gonna say publicly accessible golf because i mean i can't i can't run over cyprus like can't do that yeah (laughs) (laughs) but in my opinion poppy is poppy is my favorite course in monterey um and i get roasted all the time saying that i rank it over pebble well i'm that makes me excited because i haven't played it yet so i'm excited to you know (sighs) make it a priority next time i get down there (laughs) 
Please do. I mean, it, it's great. And if you can get out there with an NCGA member, it it's like $80 to play. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, like it's it's the way to go. What other courses outside of Pebble that you played on those on those um, so, public courses? Totally. So obviously, Band of Dunes, the whole resort. You know, on my Instagram right now, I've had like I posted a poll just yesterday about what's your what's your favorite course abandoned, and kind of surprisingly, it was Trails, Trails, then Pacific, then Dunes. And then Sheep Ranch or Old Mac were kind of in in fourth place. Um, but Trails is my favorite course out there. It's one of my favorite courses of all time. I think the yeah, there's hundreds of Lynx golf courses on the ocean, which don't get me wrong. It's beautiful. It's spectacular. It's great. But Trails has this magic where you start in the dunes, you go down to the meadows, you go up into the coastal forest, you come back again. You have like distinct, distinctly different vibes throughout the course of the round, not to mention just, you know, the strategic, you know, shot values of the whole designs I think are great. Um, and so someone left a comment and they were like, you know, I think that the reason we're starting to see more people give trails love is all of a sudden you're starting to get more people. They're going back to Bandon for their second, third, fourth trips. And once kind of the aura of the ocean washes off, then it's like you start looking at the bones of the course a little bit more and start asking yourself like, Oh, like what, what do I think really is the best golf course architecturally? And for me, it's not just the architecture. It's just the vibe. That's just kind of what I personally like. Um, so Bandit is way up there. I personally think uh, Central Oregon is the most underrated golf destination in the country. Um, you've got preach, preach. You've, you've got Pronghorn, which is high desert. You know, I think it's one of Nicholas's you know best tracks. Personally, you've got Tethero, which is wild Lynx golf in the desert, and then you've got Crosswater, which is like the quintessential Northwest. You know, rivers, forests, mountains, golf course. And those three golf courses right there, all top 100 publics, all so distinctly different from one another, yet, you know, no more than 45 minutes an hour away from each other. And to be able to go and do those three courses in one area, I think is phenomenal. Um, and I think it, it doesn't necessarily get the love it deserves. Well, and one course that doesn't even make a lot of people's rankings, which I'm shocked gets overlooked, is Juniper. I was just, so I've never played Juniper. But I was just talking to someone about so this like good. three days ago. I've heard it's amazing, one of the best muni courses in the country. And so I even made on that previous call, I said, it is my goal in 2023, I want to play Juniper this year. <laughs> you have to. So we went out to play a Northwest Golf Guys event at Crooked River Ranch out there, which is a really quirky, Super fun, quirky, like, fun. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Really cool course um, and really fun to play a two man uh, or a two ball out there. It was really a fun event. Um, but we went out there and the day before we played Juniper and I didn't really know a lot about it. I did a little research online. We stepped out there and I felt like I was at Bandon in Bend. It's yeah. just the design of it, you know, everything's waste bunkers there's really no actual structure when it comes to that it's incredibly well designed and the story behind it where like juniper was in a different part of bend and they actually moved the entire course and didn't change the name and rebuilt it it's a really cool story um but the course is probably the most underrated course in in oregon i nobody talks about it and yeah. i think it's one of the best courses i've ever played Awesome. So that again makes me excited to get out, get out and play it. Um, yeah. A few others that come to mind, just to rattle a few off: Rustic Canyon down in LA, Gil Hans's oh. design. It was in horrible shape when I played it like five years ago, but you could tell like it's just such a cool, fun, interesting golf course. Um, Circling Raven in Coeur d'Alene, I think, is severely underrated. Uh, it's like big bold golf course and I didn't really know what to expect and you kind of get out there up into the second hole uh, which is in kind of a different zone than the first hole and you look and you're like wow this is this is a golf course um, and everything across northern Michigan I think that that's you know there's so many good courses up there that are scenic that are fun you've got you know everything from like a stout challenge to a fun kind of resort course you know forest dunes bay harbor boyne 
Arcadia Bluffs. I personally like Arcadia better than Whistling Straits. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the most like architecturally amazing course, but it's just a fun golf course with some incredible views. So, so those are a few that, that stand out to me. Yeah, I I truthfully think that the the three best states for public golf are going to be um, Michigan, Oregon. And uh, Nebraska. I just, I think when you're talking public golf, I think those three states have what you want. Yeah. And I think Nebraska's new into that because there's, you know, sand hills and all of these added new courses that have been built out there in the last 15, 20 years. But Michigan just, it's ridiculous how many options they have of public golf out there. I mean, it's. It- it's spectacular. It's and the, the one I'm actually I'm going to Nebraska for the first time this spring, uh, late spring. So I'm really excited about that to see as many courses as I can, as I can in a week. Uh, the the state I would also throw out there is Wisconsin. You know, between the Kohler courses, you've got Aaron Hills, you've got you know Lasonia, you've got Sand Valley. Like that is just kind of becoming another you know mecca of great you know public and resort options out there. <laughs> I guess you could pretty much put the entire peninsula of Lake Michigan because Illinois also is ridiculous. When I was out there training for um, club champion, you know, I was one of the only guys that was given a rental car. So I would sneak out and play as much as I can. And I played cog hill while i was out there which that's is so awesome. that's the only only public course i've played in chicago was cog hill number four and that was one of the very first i think that might have been the second top 100 public course i played um and i remember going out there i shot in 97 which i was very proud of on that course and just thinking like okay this is this is unlike anything i've seen before this thing will kick my butt <laughs> It it's crazy, and well, that complex just with all four courses, the driving range, practice facility, it's a massive, massive public golf complex. Yeah, and they like like it's what's the, huge. The family behind it, the the Jesnick or something like that. The yeah, you know, it sounds like I, they've been I really don't... big proponents of of public golf in you know the city of Chicago, and so it's it's cool they, to see that kind of love and you know time and attention and effort towards promoting that. Yeah, they've got, I mean, great courses like Harborside and uh, Cantini, which is a cool, like, 30 or 28-hole, you know, rotating nine um, course. So you play a different 18 every time you book a tee time out there. Um, And then they've got one great place that I ran into was Ravislow, which is a Donald Ross uh, design. It used to be private, and then it became public, and that place is whoa like oh, untouched cool. donald ross is incredible um so here's one more i'm gonna throw out just because i want to give this course as much love as possible at the same time i also don't want to tell anybody about it because it's like one of my ultimate hidden gems i mean i guess you've played it but that's toka tea. um i have so. not played toka tea yet I okay, have not so, gotten out there, and I've been told by a dozen people that I need to get out to play Tokatee. So for people that aren't from Oregon, Tokatee is like an hour outside Eugene. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, so it's outside Eugene, but it's not really that close to, to Bend and getting into Central Oregon. And it's been around since the 60s, and you're just in this like massive forested valley. The greens are phenomenal. Um, I think it's one of the biggest, you know, hidden gem, pure golf experiences you can have. You go out, it's like 40 or 50 bucks to play. Um, but it's a, a special round every time you go out there. And so that's one of my all time favorites. I got to knock that off this week or not this week, but this year, um, I got to knock that off this year and get, get out to Toka And I'm pretty sure the person, I don't know who designed it, but as I remember it, the person that originally designed Tristing Tree is the same one that did Toka So if you're a big Tristing Tree fan, then you have even more reason to go out there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it, I've done my, my Google earth, you know, overlook of it and it looks incredible. I mean, it, being a Pacific Northwest golfer it just is on the bucket list to get out there. But like you said, it's just a little bit of a stretch to, yeah, to get out there. And it's not easy to get to for most people. <laughs> 
being in Salem, I'm not too far. I mean, it definitely can be a day trip. It's the same distance as going to Bar Run. So, I mean, I just got to make it happen. There you go. No excuses. Yeah. I'll get Juniper, you'll get Toka Tea, and then we'll compare notes at the end of the year. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so you've done write-ups for top golf courses for Cali and Oregon. I saw both of them on um, on your guys' website. Uh, how do you see these st- um, stack up and hold up against other states? So top golf courses. Yeah, so they're just very different states. For one, California's got so many golf courses. Um, you've got just about, if you want mountains, if you want ocean, if you want desert, if you want public, if you want private, like it doesn't matter. California's got it. Um, and so I think that's got a lot going for it in that regard. Oregon, if you want, you know, public courses, like we were just talking about, Oregon is one of the best public golf course or golf states in the country, but outside of Bandon, central Oregon, um, and a, a few others kind of tucked away here and there, um, you don't get quite as much of, the top, top end, you know, you've pretty much got Bandon, you've got the three courses I mentioned in Bend, and those get a lot of the love. You've got Pumpkin Ridge in Portland, which is, you know, got some, you know, some history to it. But as far as comparing it to something like, you know, LACC or Pebble or Riviera or some of the very top courses in California, then really Bandon is the only thing that's kind of at that level. Um, so I think that they're, they're very different experiences, but both amazing for, for what they are. Yeah, I would definitely throw Gerhardt in there. I think that's kind of one that gets lost in the Oregon Still conversation. Still haven't played it, which is like an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half for me. So I've got no excuses there, but I've heard amazing things. It's it's incredible. And what the, the family that owns Columbia Sportswear has done yeah. out there since they purchased that course, I mean... It's great. I mean, most people outside of Oregon don't know what McMenamins is. It's it's kind of like an Oregon TGI Fridays. It, easiest way <laughs> to explain it to somebody. It. Yeah, it, it's just it's quirky. They've got you know their distinctive different buildings and stuff, but they brought them in and they're running the restaurant out there, and it's just a great combination of everything you know good about you know, Oregon and the companies that represent Oregon with Columbia and McMenamins. It's just a perfect combination. And I think that they have done an incredible redesign out at Gerhardt since, since they took it over. And it's probably one of the best link style courses that you can play on the wet, if not in the country. Yeah. Well, that's what I've heard. It's it's also, I I think, you know, I think there's a little debate about this, but as, you know, widely regarded as the oldest course west of the Mississippi as well. Uh, so you've got some, some history there and, you know, there's, I know there's a little bit of debate around there, but very, very old regardless. Yeah, there was a course in the Bay Area. Um, oh, the name of it is slipping my mind. It actually closed down in 2020. Um, it was... It was on an island um, near Vallejo. I don't know why I can't remember the name of it, but it was an incredible. It was on an mi- old military base, and like the tee boxes were on top of like old, like missile silo bunkers. Like it was one of the coolest Crazy. courses I've ever played. And they closed it down in 2020, and I loved the course. It was a super fun course to play. Originally, it was the original nine. They, they claim being the oldest course west of the Mississippi. But I think there's at least 15 courses that claim that. Yeah, for sure. Regardless, worth the experience to, to get out there. And that's another one I've got no excuse. Hoping to knock that off this year. So, without borders, um, what would you say your favorite... And it doesn't have to be public, um, but favorite courses that... Let's do top three favorite courses you've played anywhere in the world. Got it. Um, so first is Pebble. Uh, second is National Golf Links um, out on, on Long Island. You know, it's kind of like the St. Andrews of America. It's just such a cool experience. You've got so many interesting template holes, blind shots, greens that you would never see being built these days. Um, so that's amazing. Uh, three is Marion. 
Um, so three very different golf courses. Um, but I actually public publish my top 100 list every year. And so every December I go back and I kind of adjust it, add in new courses that I've played. Um, so those are the three, you know, kind of top, top ones right now, but six of the top 10 are publicly accessible. Um, so those, th- you know, Pebble, obviously, uh, in that list, we also have Royal Dornick and North Berwick in Scotland. Um, two just amazing courses. Dornick especially is, it's difficult to get to, but is like 100% worth the, the trip and the effort. Uh, I've got Bandon Trails in that top 10. Uh, and I've got Punta Espada in Dominican Republic. And so this is a course that wildly overlooked, you know, whenever people are talking about the Caribbean and they're talking about Dominican Republic, it's always Pete Dye's classic Casa de Campo, uh, which I actually, I haven't played that, so I can't compare them. But Punta Spot is a Jack Nicholas design that's, it's truly like the Pebble Beach of the Caribbean, where it's got similarities to Bandon Dunes in the sense, the original Bandon Dunes course, which I think has one of the best flows of any golf course ever, where you start kind of inland, you get out to the fourth hole, you spend some time out on the ocean for a couple of holes, you come in, you go back out to the ocean. And Punta Espada has that like on steroids, where it's like, you'll go out and you will be like right on the ocean for a hole or two. And then you'll come back and you'll be hitting over a cove to a par three green and you'll come back. So it's, it's just a, a very cool, very fun, very scenic golf course that I don't think it's talked about enough. That's the thing. I mean, we have we have such a vast array of golf courses in America. It it's it's hard for and I actually kind of had a conversation with Garrett Morrison about this and Yeah. You know, it's hard to to go outside the country when we have the options that we have in the United States where I don't even feel like I've tapped the US like even close to where I need to be. I haven't really left the West coast too much outside of the Chicago area when it comes to golf. And it's hard to get out to those places, which is awesome to talk to people like you that have been able to reach out and go play, you know, those, those type of courses, because I want to get out there. My, my brother-in-law and uh, my sister-in-law live in London and he's from he's from just outside of Dublin. So we're going to be going out there in 2024 and I'm going to nice. stay for a couple weeks and I'm going to try to play some courses just outside of London and England. I was talking to Garrett a little bit about how he thinks that England is extremely underrated when it comes to great golf. Like everybody yep. talks about Ireland and Scotland. And he's like you're going to be absolutely blown away. The courses that were built in the 20s and 30s in England might be some of the best golf that you'll be able to, you know, experience. Yep. And so I'm going to try to get a few rounds in in England, then jump over um, to Scotland and Ireland and be able to go out there and play a little bit. So I'll have to report back to you next year when Uh, when we get out there and do that. But I'm excited. It's... I, it's something I've always dreamed of going over there and playing and it's just never been feasible. And finally, you know, having a free place to stay out there makes it a little bit easier for us. Absolutely. And I've heard that so many times about England um, that it's just this kind of like, you know, sleeper, like you compare it to anything else. And it's like one of the best, you know, you know, golf regions in the world. But then when it's right next to Scotland and right next to Ireland, it's kind of that, you know, gets, I feel like that's, Oregon, you know, you've got Bandon and then Bend gets overlooked because you've got Bandon, which is so good close by. Um, but I've never played at all in England as well. Uh, but there's so many tracks. And so I can't wait to see, especially if you get to go over there for a couple of weeks and get to experience a little bit of all three of those countries. Uh, I can't wait to see, see what your thoughts are. But also I answered my, you know, top three of all time. What are your top three of all time? Oh, um, so top three of what I have played public golf wise, um, I put Poppy Hills up there. It's in my top three public gore or public courses to play. Um, I would, I would say, um, man, I don't get asked. I ask everybody else that question, but I don't. I don't get asked that question. Yeah. Well, very you, can, often. you can come um, back to me another time and add it in the show notes if you, you need know to. What? <laughs> there's there's a course out in Vegas um, called Paiute, 
Um, it's okay. a trio of three Pete Dye courses, and I would probably put I would put the trio on on there. I mean, I don't think I could pick one particular course. We played all three of them out there, but. That complex is incredible. Um, it's built on a Indian reserve ran by the the um, actual tribe, and it's an incredible, you know, trio of golf courses. I would put that up there for me, um, and then I would probably, ooh, um, you know what? I actually would put Presidio. Uh, in San Francisco up there. I think it's cool. extremely underrated in the public golf scene. I think it's probably one of the best publicly accessible golf courses. And people go to San Francisco, they're always looking to play Olympic Club, San Francisco, Cal, you know, all the private things that right. they can get on there. Or they go and play Harding, where I think for the cost, you can go play Presidio for 100 bucks. Skip Harding for two fifty, and you're gonna enjoy, in my opinion, Presidio more than you will Harding. All right, I've so I haven't played Presidio or Harding. So next time I'm down in San Francisco, Presidio it is. Yeah. So if you get down to the down to the bay, um, contact us because Ashton lives in San Francisco, um, and so he he would love to play with you. And Presidio is his home track, so he oh, plays cool. there. <laughs> more than anywhere and i just think it's extremely extremely underrated and kind of like another one that um is starting to get up in the ranks is a course called baylands okay. um down in palo alto it used to be called palo alto muni they had it redesigned um and it's kind of like an australian sandbelt style lynx course okay and so it's right on the the bottom part of the peninsula. No trees, wide open, and uh, cool. you know the defense is very much like Bandon, where if the weather is kicking, the wind's coming off the ocean, it's a devastating round out there. <laughs> um, but it's always in great shape, and it's uh, probably one of the best designs in in the entire Bay Area on the public side of golf. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I've never even heard so, of that one. So next time we get down, I have a few places to check out. Yeah, Baylands is worth it. I mean, Cinnabar down in San Jose is an incredibly good course. There's the Jack Nicholas duo at uh, Coyote Creek down yep. in Morgan Hill. That place is awesome as well. That was my home course in high school. I mean, I could go on. There is yeah. <laughs> There's so much good great. golf out there. So Yeah. And something I guess I don't really ever talk about are our private courses. So I'll give you my three top private courses. I know I might get roasted by all of our listeners because we're public, but well, um, they're, they're going to just hate me then because so much of my <laughs> golf experience has been private. So I'm sorry. Roast me in the comments, <laughs> <laughs> but private for me, um, from what I've been able to play and experience, um, I would put Lake Merced, up there i also played lake merced prior to the redesign yeah um one of our good friends is a member out there so i'm hoping to get back out there next year and be able to play the new the new design but even before the redesign i thought it was one of the best courses i've ever played um there's a course called green hills just south of San Francisco, uh, Alistair McKenzie design. Everybody talks about Meadow um, and and Pasa, but I think Green Hills is probably one of the most overlooked Alistair courses in the Bay Area. Cool. Um, and it's really good. Like, the way I explain it is it's kind of like an everyday man's Alistair McKenzie course. Like, it's a course you can get out and play every day and enjoy it where pasa is a course that is going to beat It'll the shit be out of you yeah <laughs> yeah where green hills is a little bit more toned down um you're still going to get all the alistair bunkers and greens that you can ask for but it's not as severe of a uh, terrain as pasa yeah. is so it's a little bit more playable 
and and it's just spectacular. So if you get down to the bay, we'll get you on the Green Hills as well, and and get you out there. Cool. And then I would put um, um, Waverly up there. I I think Waverly is phenomenal, especially after the the work that Gil Hans did. It's I mean the the closing stretch, you know, sixteen going right down to the Lamet and then back to back par five finisher right on the river is definitely a pretty cool vibe. Yeah. And then after that, I guess I would have like my, my asterisk on the next one. And that would be Astoria. Yeah. The story is cool. I just, it's just, it's, it's not the most spectacular set of greens that you're going to come across. It's, it's not the most incredible, you know, layout, but just the land usage with the half pipe fairways and yep. <laughs> you, it's just something you're never going to experience at any other golf course. It's unique all in its own. And I don't think there is a course across the country that, that resembles Astoria. Yeah. I would not disagree with that. The first time I've, I've actually, I've played it twice, but both times I've only played the front nine. <laughs> Um, so I haven't seen the back nine, but the front nine, every time it's like each hole, you're like, Oh, this is cool. Oh, I wasn't expecting this. This is cool. It's like the whole round was just like that. So, but very interesting. I mean, super interesting, but Hey, Sean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep you any longer. I appreciate you coming on guys. If you can check out breaking 80.com Follow Breaking 80 on Instagram. It's an incredibly good follow. Check out his website. There is endless sources of of knowledge and, you know, um, reviews to kind of lead you in the right direction for what golf course to play in the different regions that you're going to be visiting. So follow along. Check out Breaking 80. It is absolutely worth it. And again, Sean, thank you so much for coming on. Dude, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and looking forward to getting out and uh, playing some golf this year. Uh-huh.